was no reason why a young, vivacious individual who has such a life ahead of her should die. And uh, still hangs over my mind. That was the most unfortunate thing to, to witness. Uh, she got pregnant in really unfortunate circumstances and couldn't terminate her pregnancy. I see that everywhere. The vulnerability and uh, the possibility of exploitation of women. Welcome. You're listening to Ward Stories, a podcast series where doctors tell their stories. We give an inside look into the heart and soul of the medical profession, sharing both the joys and difficult moments which make up a career. Ward Stories is a production by medical students Stephen Sabati, Sam Notla, and Cameron Kwan. Listeners' discretion is advised. This program contains material that some may find disturbing and uses explicit language. Welcome to Volume 2, Episode 2. I'm Cameron Kwan. I'm Stephen Sabati. And I'm Sam Notla. This is a continuation of our conversation with Dr. Rajiv Rongras, a family medicine and OBGYN physician working in Michigan. In the last episode, he talked about his experiences practicing in India, England, and the United States. In this episode, we discuss some of his interesting cases and philosophy on life and medicine. We also end our discussion about the physician and mid-level relationship. Again, while we do touch on some of the controversies surrounding pregnancy care and abortion, for context, this interview was recorded before the recent landmark Dobbs v. Jackson decision by the Supreme Court. I think that we have a really good episode in store for you guys today. I really enjoy how Dr. Rongrass talks about multiple controversial or difficult subjects without really holding anything back. Um, He's one of those people that kind of just tells it how he feels it, but he also does it in a way that's um, open and respectful to everyone involved. I was a chief resident in those days in India. My house officer come to me and say that there's a very sick patient in the receiving room. Well, she wasn't answering his questions and she was a little toxic, but he said there was a tapeworm hanging out of her vagina. That's why he, she was there. It's true. And the story sounded uh, very odd after all. You know, I come from a tropical country. There's a lot of parasitic infestations, but I hadn't heard of a tapeworm hanging out of the vagina. So, uh, I went over to see her. Here's somebody who was febrile, tachycardic, a little hypotensive, clearly dehydrated, and had a very tense belly. Uh, she was very quiet, didn't want to say very much, and I examined her uh, to note that somebody had ripped out a piece of intestine through her posterior vaginal fornix in the course of performing uh, uh, a termination of pregnancy in the community. So as it happened, we later found out she was a nurse who didn't want to come to a hospital to have her termination of pregnancy performed and you know had conceived under tragic circumstances. So I do remember going to the operating room uh, with the chief surgical resident to operate on her. She had fecal peritonitis and uh, uh, ended after that surgery uh, with a colostomy and in the ICU had endotoxic shock and septicemia and later died. I was a young, probably in her early 20s. So, and this is when in, in the era that uh, termination of pregnancy had been already very much legalized and uh, available. But this brought to light that uh, women would go to the ends of the earth if they want to have a pregnancy terminated, and they want to keep it quiet and confidential. You don't know the vulnerability and uh, the possibility of exploitation of women in many different environments in the world, and I see that everywhere, not just in India. I saw that in the UK, I saw that, I see that here. There were other instances where, which were not so extreme, where women died because somebody had used bad skills in the community, or purporting to be someone who could provide abortion services. Yeah, there was no reason why a young, vivacious individual who has such a life ahead of her should die because uh, she got pregnant in really unfortunate circumstances and couldn't terminate her pregnancy. That was the most unfortunate thing to, to witness and uh, still hangs over my mind. You know, The circumstance, you go in there, you open up the belly, and just, uh, it's a fecal peritonitis. You know you're not going to be able to save her. So 
uh, at least in that environment, you know, with limited resources. So I think uh, it's very important to learn from these instances. So that was a story that uh, I had. There was another story which uh, was of a young girl, probably 14, who came to my clinic. I was a resident at that time, and my attending was there, and the parents brought her uh, to the clinic saying that she had developed a, a big mass in the belly. And they were worried. She was a very slim girl, and the mother probably noticed this lump in the belly. And uh, uh, it came to light that there was actually a pregnancy and that she had been abused by her older sister's husband. You know, that kind of thing also goes on. So the whole tragedy, how we broke the news to the parents in a quiet room, or how they, it was like the whole family was shattered. So I think a lot of my professional views, uh, which are consistent with the views of the colleges, uh, you know, I, it's not a radical view or something, you know, I, uh, the free availability of birth control and access to services where they can have termination pregnancy in a safe manner is integral to the practice of OBGYN. It cannot be, cannot be separated. If you, if you separate that, then it's not OBGYN. Well woman health care or something like that, you can call it, but it's not OBGYN. When you're, you know, the doctor who is working with these women and terminating pregnancies, it sounds like a super vulnerable and, you know, touchy interaction. Like, what is your approach to those interactions and um, what kind of, like, relationship do you build with patients that's different for those patients versus um, any other kind of interaction? Uh, yes, I think the important thing is uh, to listen to the woman's story and uh, at the same time not not appear to be too intrusive because she may not want to share some of her bad experiences or relive some of those. I think it's very important, therefore, to be respectful and not be judgmental and all their choices. And in the end, I think you have to be humble and accept her decision and respect that decision and help her along within the bounds of the laws of the land. How do you toe that line, right? You talked about, you know, you have to find out what went on, but you also don't want to make them relive their trauma too much. It seems like it might be like a little bit of an art to doing that, right? You want to make your patient as comfortable as you can while also needing to get these really sensitive details out of them. I think when you see enough of these women, you can see by how they're, how firm their resolution is that the decision's already been made. And if you're going to be a stumbling block in their way, they're going to go to somebody else. I, th I think you get a sense for it that you can ask so much and no more. I, I can't really put that into more precise words, if I can say so. I think that's fair, right? A lot of this stuff is you kind of just get a feel for it. It's, it's hard to you know, pin down what exactly is going on. There's a thing we talked about with body language, right? Where like have open body language if you want to hold their hand or touch their shoulder and stuff. But then you get in the actual situation and you're like, is it appropriate if I do this right now? I think it's important to, to communicate that you have the ability to listen. Yeah. And, uh, and that you have compassion for how they're feeling. I've had some very fine physicians inspire me in this regard. Talking of stories, there was one physician at King's College Hospital. I was there for a very short while. Uh, King's College Hospital in London had a very fine IVF clinic, so I asked to rotate over there during my free afternoon. And uh, John Parsons was the lead clinician out there, a very humble man, so fine. His counseling of the patients as to what course they would take for the infertility management was absolutely superb. And he would do a busy morning in the infertility clinic, then get, get onto his bicycle and go over that hill to the satellite clinic for King's College Hospital and then go and perform like 12 or 13 terminations of pregnancy, you know. And uh, you say, well, you, you're an infertility specialist and, you know, it, it would be natural to ask that question. And I did happen to ask him because I saw that here's somebody who's helping people in one area and suddenly he's doing the exact opposite in the afternoon. His answer was that different women have different needs. I'm, I'm just a servant, he said. And that really impacted me to be the servant, you know, to, to serve the woman in front of you. And different women have different needs. You have to be malleable and not judgmental and be able to offer this and offer that. 
Yeah. And if you're not because of the environment in which you work, at least be kind. Mm -hmm. At least be kind and compassionate. Be understanding of somebody's limitations. In the end, we'll never know what another individual goes through or what their life is like. So it's very, understand very difficult to put yourself in the shoes of another, you know. Yeah. Their financial background, their emotional, their social situation, you know, what disadvantage they grew up in. It's very hard to really get into that. So I think it's just important, therefore, to, to be a good listener and maybe you get it up to a point and no more, and that's all right. You know, as doctors, like, we amass all this knowledge and experience and, you know, clinical acumen, and it leads to, like, a certain assurity and then that might lead to like not really taking the time to like listen to patients. Like my, my experience with a majority of doctors I've seen for my own care is that, you know, if they're convinced of something, there's no way you're like, they don't want to hear anything else. I don't think I'm a great communicator uh, myself, but I, but I think the answer lies in just listening, you know, just sit down, just listen what they have to say and listen to the story and be inquisitive, be inquisitive. Because you can listen so much after that, you have to be inquisitive. And, and you in, your curiosity should be to serve the individual, not because you want to get some gossip out of it. You know, so you, because as soon as the patient leaves, it's forgotten. It's, it belongs to a chart, right? All that. You're not taking that home with you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have that background, to be curious, uh, keeping compassion in mind but just to listen. I, th I think uh, I, I, I found that course that I taught here uh, very educational for my own self. So you're in a position of great advantage. You know, you meet so many different clinicians, you've had so much input into your minds in these most formative years of your life that uh, I envy you. I could do med school all over again if you really asked me to. I would learn so much more, I'd be a better doctor, I suppose. I feel like very few people here would say that they would do it again. <laughs> Well, maybe it's maybe it seems better the farther you get away from it. Yeah. If you made me do the first two years again, I would kill you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, given that um, you've done most of your work in OBGYN, as students who are eventually going to be rotating in it, what do you think are some like really big things for us to look out for that we might not think about going into it? Firstly, your med school is going to prepare you in many ways. You know that your communication skills. You know you have to know that when you go in, especially as a male, you always have to have a chaperone. Mm -hmm. You know, I think those are those are important things. Women are tender by nature. You know, compared, I think it's very important to be be a little familiar with their tender nature. You know, so. I always tell my patients, um, as my residents, that. The most important thing for women's health, more than anything else, is that you have to have your philosophy right. Philosophy, then art, then science. Somebody said, what is your philosophy? I said, we bend over backwards to accommodate the wishes of the women we serve. That's the philosophy, it's very simple. You know. We bend over backwards to accommodate the wishes, the desires of the women who we serve. Know, what they are there for, you know, it's, it applies to labor especially, you know, so they have so many choices. I always tell my patients, you always have three choices at any given time, except the one circumstance we really need to get the baby out, you have just the one choice, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> as to go along with what the doctor is saying, because now uh, we have a difficult situation. But, so it's important to be respectful of the women's choices. You have to have your philosophy right. Uh, then I think comes the art of medicine and that you learn by watching others around you. That despite all the science, despite that, you still have to serve her, that you bend over backwards to accommodate what she wants so long as things are not unsafe. Mm -hmm. I think this applies to all different walks of life too. I mean, you have the, if you're a school teacher, you have to have your you know, kindergarten teacher or preschool. You have to have your philosophy right. If you come home and you crib in front of your husband, the kids are just terrible, they just jump all over the place, they jump on the desk, and some of them are not very well toilet trained. Well, you learn to deal with some of that stuff, right? So if you're gonna come home and complain about all of that, uh, you got your philosophy wrong, maybe you should be doing something else, maybe teaching high school, you know? right? There's, a, there's an art in counseling the patient, how you inform them all the choices. I was telling my patients, sometimes I'd read charts and they say, patient had so-and-so problem and wants hysterectomy, therefore let's list her for the hysterectomy. And that's not the right thing to do. 
This is not McDonald's. You can't walk in and say, I want a burger and a milkshake and a hot coffee along with that, you know, so order whatever. You just pay the money and you get all those items, right? I've been to some fine restaurants on my trips abroad and you go to some of the European restaurants and you order the wrong wine. The chef's going to come out of the kitchen and say, no, 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 that's not the wine with this fish. You can't have Cabernet. You have to have Chardonnay with this one. This is the, this fish. This is what goes. He's going to be upset. Well, you're the one with the knowledge, the professional knowledge. So you have to be very uh, responsible that you have to tell the patient what you think is the best decision for her. Obviously, I think given my knowledge and understanding of your circumstances, A is the best decision. But you may feel that B is a better choice for you personally because your husband's going to be away or, you know, you know. And that's okay with me. We go along with B. C, we can agree upon, but D is completely unacceptable. Let's talk a little bit about um, just being a gynecologist in general. Like, how did you arrive at that path? And it's just kind of fascinating to me, like, especially as a man working with women your whole career, like, how is that changed your view of what it's like to be a woman or certainly spending a whole career just having women as your only patients. My pediatric experience in uh, New Delhi uh, was horrific, if I may say so, because every time I was on emergency call in my team, we'd end up losing three or four babies. It was very sad, the crying of these mothers when they lost the baby. It was always a tragedy. Every night was a tragedy. The, the babies came from neighboring villages. They were, had meningitis. They had diarrhea with extreme dehydration. There was nothing we could do to save them. Some of them came in such extreme circumstances. Uh, when I went for the next six months to OBGYN, every day was a party because uh, a lot of the staff delivered over there. It was, you know, babies were being born. It was a happier place, if I can say so. Yes, surely we did have some maternal deaths in the course of that, of women arriving with eclamptic seizures or with ruptured uteruses. Well, they were few and far between in that area. Uh, women still knew that they had to come for prenatal care and there was a big hospital which delivered about 13,000 women in a year. So you, naturally you have some bad outcomes here and there. But overall, it was a happier place and uh, there was more camaraderie. I loved the fact that you could do medicine and surgery, that there was physiology intermingled with pathology. It has been a great privilege to serve women, let's put it that way. And I would do that any day. Uh, I had uh, women say to me, uh, especially younger women, oh, I feel very awkward, you know, I've not been examined by a man before. And uh, I'd learned a saying from one of my professors in the past, oh, don't worry, we're all women here, you know, so I just look like a man. So I would do the same thing with my women in Plainwell when I first started working for Borges. And my medical assistant gave me a little plaque on my birthday. And I still have that displayed on my study table in my house. It says, we are all women here. So I think after a point, you tell them, you say, oh, we're all women here. I just look like a man. And you know, so it's important to communicate that you understand what they say. I mean, we asked a lot about um, you know, the rougher stuff you had to see, yeah. right? Um, how about, can you give me an example of probably the patient that gave you your happiest experience? I think as a surgeon, when you relieve somebody's discomfort by operating on them, that's always a very satisfying experience. You know, a woman comes in with an ectopic pregnancy, she has acute pain, and now she has labor not progressing because the baby is in a very awkward position and uh, she just cannot physiologically deliver that baby because the baby has an extended head or something like that. And you, you go and all the uterus is not contracting very well, you do a C-section. It's a very satisfying thing because can you imagine what would happen in the era gone by, say even 150 years ago, you would probably end up losing that woman, right? Mm -hmm. So I think these are the marvels of modern medicine and I, I just can't seem to forget it even on a regular basis. I just can't seem to take it for granted that I can take somebody to the operating room with the help of all my staff. And I know at the end of that, they often come and say to you, doctor, we are very grateful, but you know that you were only a small part of that. Uh, they were the people who admitted her in the emergency room called you to the emergency room, there were the staff who prepared for the surgery, the anesthesiologist who comes in, and sometimes it seems unfair that uh, uh, they give you the glory for that. Uh, and I think it's, I'm always cognizant of the fact that I just had a small role, I can only do so much. And sometimes people come to me and say, uh, doctor, this was so wonderful, we had our baby. Um, you know, it's, it's joyous, no doubt, and that you delivered 
uh, our child. And uh, it's good to, good to acknowledge that, but it's also important to acknowledge that uh, there's a much larger role. Uh, and yes, it's good to acknowledge the, the gratitude, uh, but it's important not to rest on that. So I always tell my students and residents that every day is a new day. You have to make a fresh resolve that you'll do the right thing for the patient. As a surgeon, there's a lot of potential for harming people, uh, especially when you start mixing money with medicine. We are incentivized to operate more. And our healthcare system is built like that. If I operate more, my manager will be happier with me because my productivity goes up, you know? So it's always at the back of your mind when you have, when you're at crossroads. Should I operate or should I manage this with medications? You know, um, it's very important to uh, be completely honest with the patient. When I go into the room, I try to remind myself that the only God I'm going to serve is the patient in front of me, you know? Mm -hmm. Not going to serve anybody else, okay? and not, not, not the RVU God. The RVU is a relative value unit, okay, which is a very big God that we serve you know, in our system in America. Everybody's geared to producing more and making that bonus at the end of the quarter. I think it's, uh, it's a tremendous pitfall in the practice of medicine. You know, I know that it's important not to be a lazy physician, but I think you have to really be watchful of yourself. You have to do the right thing for the patient. Just remind yourself at that moment who you come to serve before anybody else. I think that is a very uh, important, uh, you know, place where I dig my heels. I say, no, this is this is who I serve, and I serve no one else. Going back to you talking about, you know, the patient is the only God you serve. I really love that whole like analogy of, you know, medicine kind of being like the sacred practice. And um, I've heard like that author Abraham Verghese talk about that, how the exam room is like, it's like a sacred space. And when he enters, you know, you wash your hands and it's kind of like this cleansing, like there's like a ritual to it. And that something about medicine is like fulfilling this like human need that we've always had, you know, like medicine, medicine men and shaman. And we're kind of like the modern equivalent of that. And behind all the science, there's something just about this like relationship and I wondered, like, do you have any ritual or how do you actually, like, stop to enter that exam room with, with the best intentions and with a clear mind and um, cognizant of who you're serving? For me personally? Yeah. It's in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I it, honestly, yes. Yeah. I, that's, my, that's my moment of two, two minutes of meditation and prayer that I not harm anybody that day. I do the right thing, so. I come from a tradition which doesn't believe in an external God, so I believe we're all sparks of the divine. And I think it's very important to connect with that energy inside of you and say that I'm going with a sacred purpose in mind and uh, I would hope not to harm anyone or do anyone injustice. It's a calling, right? I don't go there. I mean, I've, if it was just a matter of making money, I'd probably do something different, you know, but you just have to put a little break on your greed. I think be satisfied, learn more to be uh, to be more content. But I think somewhere along, there's always the potential for uh, uh, perversion towards making more. You know, just like any other field of medicine has people that go astray, I guess medicine also will have its small number of people, hopefully. Do you have children? Yes, I do. Were you there for their birth? Yes, for both of them. Um, so what is that like being an OBGYN, you know, having done countless um, you know, having been there for countless births, but it's your wife and child on the on the it table. It didn't matter. No? <laughs> to my wife, it did not matter that I was over you. <laughs> well, as it happened, you know, I was, uh, uh, when my son was born, this was 35 years ago in December. Uh, I was in England. I was uh, uh, the position of a registrar. I worked in the same ob department, and uh, my uh, attending was the one who came in, and I was called into, my wife came, had been at home. We were new in the country. She suffered a lot of the labor pains at home. So she has a little bad memory about all of that. I was not available. It was 18th of December. And uh, that's Christmas time in England. And you pretty much surrender your pager and you go from one ward to the other, so wishing everyone Merry Christmas. Okay, so she couldn't get hold of me. In the afternoon, I had an operating list. And uh, I just finished a hysterectomy and somebody snuck their 
head round the door and said, your wife's in labor and about to start pushing. So I think that was a little unfortunate. I missed most of the labor. Uh, she, she herself missed most of the labor. She arrived and it was too late to even give her some pain medication, having suffered all of that at home. She walked across the parking lot to come into the labor and delivery and uh, I went there and she wanted a mop from me and I was the husband here, so I gave her a mop which she flung straight in my face because <laughs> it was too warm. She wanted a cold mop, you know, so. And uh, I, I do remember my attending saying, poor Rajiv, he said. I was no longer the doctor out there. The second time I think I was a little more involved uh, and I was there and I, I was at that time uh, at Henry Ford Hospital and I actually called the attending to say that there were uh, concerns on the fetal heart tracing. And he agreed and he came in and did the C-section. But once we were in the operating room, I was behind a little screen. and He did his job, so I was just the husband. I think that was just as well. Speaking of ambition, what drives you in this part of your career and do you, what do you hope to accomplish uh, with this part of your career? I went to a very fine med school in the south of India and a lot of my batchmates, I come from a very small batch of 65. A lot of them are in academia and have published a lot. So sometimes when I am in their company, either online or in person, I feel a little small. You know, I don't feel that. Think of myself as an ordinary physician. So what fires me is, uh, I've thought about this many times, what truly is success? You know, it doesn't mean that you have a professor or a chairman of a department. Is that success? Or I, I don't know. I think I've learned to appreciate the small successes on a daily basis. And if I can go and serve somebody and they have a good outcome and they feel happy and I feel that I've done something here where I didn't harm them and made their lives maybe just a little better, that is my success for that day. And that is enough to fire me with the passion that I would like to keep till my last breath. So when you have a bad day, right, mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that? when you have a day where it doesn't seem like things are going right? I cannot overemphasize that as professionals, you just have to be kind to your fellow professionals. Not be overcritical. We all make difficult decisions. It's very difficult to put yourself in the position of somebody who was uh, walking the tightrope at two in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. and made a decision that in retrospect turns out not to be the best one. Very easy to be smart in retrospect. But I think it's important to be kind. Good to learn from that, but also important to be kind and or at least not be unkind to someone. So we we can have other motivations get the better of us sometimes as professionals and uh, lead us to take political advantage of our colleagues or or vice versa. I think we should be very cautious about that. Since you've worked, you know, You've had a lengthy career and you've worked in so many different environments. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are about this. Um, as time goes on, everyone becomes specialists and there's so many more like career paths that you can go down to work in medicine. Like, as you said, you have PAs, NPs, respiratory therapists, social workers, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these um, professionals are kind of doing similar things at certain times. Like within that context, is there anything that you think is like special or unique about being a physician versus taking care of people in other roles? You know, I'm very grateful that we do have some of the mid-levels. Having said that, uh, it's just natural, the kind of training you go through with these years of med school, then, then the residency training, that your perspective is going to be different and broader in terms of your knowledge. So I think physician assistants should remain physician assistants, and they should be assisting you in your job. And I know that we have physician assistants in specialties where they do a great job, but as a physician, you should always remember that no matter what specialty you are in, you still are a fundamental, basic pr physician. Never lose sight of that. You could be a neurosurgeon, you still need to know how to auscultate the chest, and, you know, so I think that's very important. So never lose sight of uh, the fact that you're a basic doctor. I do have patients who come and say that they saw Dr. Susan takes care of them or Dr. Matthew, and you know that Susan is not a doctor and Matthew is not a doctor. Uh, it's very natural for patients to say this because when you go and see someone, you give them charge over your body. The very fact that you give them a charge of, uh, over your body because you're sick, you want them to treat you, 
you want to put them into that role of doctor or physician. They may not be qualified as that. And I found that some of my colleagues have felt very insulted when they were said that they were told that, or told by a patient that I saw Dr. Matthew, I saw Dr. Susan, they know very well that Susan Matthew of PA or NP, and they said, well, that's not a doctor, that's a nurse practitioner. It's important, however, to maintain your professional edge. Just because you're qualified and were given the title of doctor does not automatically put you in that position forever. So there's a struggle in my life to stay at the cutting edge. There is, always. And, uh, you know, if you are not watchful of that and your PA or your nurse practitioner is more knowledgeable than you, then I think shame on you. So I think that's a very important aspect of your professionalism, that you will maintain that edge you will not lose it because it's very easy to lose it. You have a significant advantage, four years of med school, four years of res three or four years of residency, that's, that's a lot. And then clinical experience after that, and look at all the college years that you've done beforehand. But you, in, med in medicine, you can never rest on your laurels. I always tell medical students, sometimes patients tell you, doctor, you are such a fine doctor. Oh, you're the most wonderful doctor. The day you start believing that, that's the death knell of your future practice. But every day you have to remind yourself it's a fresh day. You have to make a fresh resolve to do the right thing. Every day is a fresh day. Every day you have to make a resolve that I'll try my utmost to be up to date with what's going on around me. You have to be also aware of the world around you. And I found what Dr. Reba, I, I, I think he's a wonderful man. What he said once was very interesting. He said, every day I tell doctors who train on me that every day you must have an hour of your time for your profession, professional reading, and maybe up to an hour for just informing yourself of the world around you. I have some personal preferences. I've had medical students come through to me. I'm a great believer that you should have one journal that you should really follow that gives you the perspective of being a physician. You know, for me, personal choice is the Lancet. It doesn't matter. You can be an ophthalmologist, you can be a dermatologist, no matter what specialty you're in. You have that one journal that keeps you anchored in your basic role as a physician. You have New England Journal, your Annals of Internal Medicine, whatever. So yes, I can believe that some people out there might feel there's a threat from mid-levels because they want to have a, they're having an increasing role in our system. But I think we should think of them as complementary to us and always persevere to keep the cutting edge. So I really enjoyed the discussion about the role of mid-levels and the relationship that they have with physicians. I like the part where Dr. Rongress was talking about where we need to respect the division of the role, but also recognize uh, while mid-levels fulfill one aspect in that role, doctors still need to earn their title, which is a lifelong pursuit. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear him talk so honestly. It's, you know, it's kind of a hot button topic. Um, in the last couple of years with um, all these bills kind of expanding the scope of practice for um, mid-level practitioners. Um, not to get into the weeds of that debate, but it was refreshing to hear him just speak so openly and bluntly about it. Um, and it's, you know, pri prioritizing the care of the patient and also the responsibility of the doctor to really be as up on their stuff as they can. Yeah, I especially enjoyed that. Um, section about responsibility and that lifelong commitment that you guys were talking about. I think it really reflects a bigger role that we play in society, which is that people with power need to do things to justify the power that they have. Um, just because you have a position of authority doesn't mean that you deserve that position of authority. As doctors, we need to prove that every day in the clinic, but also at home where we take our time to keep up to date on the newest practices and methodologies. So I'd like to go back and explain the initial story that our episode opened with. So for that young lady, there was an attempt to retrieve the fetus, but instead of going through the cervix, which is the entrance to the uterus where the fetus is, they went through the posterior fornix, which is basically an empty space right below that opening. So when they punctured through there, they went into the abdomen where the bowel is. Yeah, it's one thing to hear about back alley abortions in the abstract, you know, as a potential downside to um, restricting access to abortion. 
but it's a whole nother thing to hear a story of a real person that suffered a horrible um, injury and death because of, uh, you know, a non-medical abortion provided at home or wherever. It was a pretty shocking story. I think a big thing that the medical field needs to deal with is being accessible to patients, but also a safe space. You think about the patient that we talked about in the story, you think about a catastrophic loss of life, loss of potential um, for an individual who had to resort to those affairs because she didn't feel like she could trust the medical system, because she felt like she needed to go somewhere else that someone might find out. Um, And I think that is a pitfall that we have to deal with every day. And lastly, I just wanted to comment on Dr. Rongress's philosophy about serving his patients. I appreciate the way that he tries to balance the use of his expertise, but also allow his patients to have options and understand that every patient has a special circumstance. And ultimately, uh, he wants to come to a shared decision in their care. Yeah, personal favorite of mine was when you talked about the only God in the room that you are serving is the patient. It's not the RVU God, the one that gives us money, pays our salaries. It's the patient that's coming to you looking for help, and you're the one that's there for them. Yeah, personally, I'm still down with the RVU God. Um, I'm not sure who you guys are worshiping, but um, I'd like to take this moment to thank the RVU God. Yeah, but all kidding aside, um, I really love the way... Dr. Rongross kind of frames the physician-patient relationship as, you know, the exam room or the operating room being kind of like a sacred space where the patient really is the only one that you're concerned with, the only one that you're serving, and you kind of have to come correct, you know, when you're dealing with a patient. This is, they're the most important part of that relationship, and you exist to serve them at that moment. At the end of the day, we're going to spend our entire lives and careers, regardless of what field you're in, medical or otherwise, trying to develop a philosophy on how we see the world and how we want to operate within it. Whether that's between ourselves and patients, ourselves and fellow colleagues, um, ourselves and fellow colleagues who are in similar positions, like the mid-level debate we talked about earlier, or ourselves and the legal medical system, such as when we're talking about cases like abortion and where medical care lands in the middle of all that. Um, All these things are going to be aspects of ourselves that we're going to have to develop throughout our lives. And I hope that this podcast helps some people along that way. If you enjoyed what you heard, consider leaving a like and a subscribe and following us on our various social media platforms. We also have a website, all of the links in the description below. Your support will greatly help us continue to make more episodes. We already have a lot of great new content in the works, so we hope to see you next time. Thank you.